I enter the path of male experience. Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience presented by DraftKings, the Memorial Tournament. DraftKings picks preview, one and done. Not quite the final betting card as of yet because we're doing this a day early than we normally do. It's coming out on a Tuesday, not a Wednesday. Tambo isn't here. Joe Iadone is on the line with me to break this all down. Remember to check out the Preferred Lines podcast as well after you watch and or listen to this show. The Listener's League link down in the description. Let's get that filled so we can have a huge one for the U.S. Open. Smash the like, sub to the channel. If you do want the final bets and all of the final information, highly recommend that you subscribe to the free Mayo Media Newsletter and get all of that checked out. Joe, it's early in the week. You still ready to talk about the memorial? I'm always ready to talk to you, man. I appreciate the the call up today. Um, shout out to Tambo. I hope you're enjoying yourself. Happy to take in a relief role here. And, and also Ben, I can't believe you didn't have Ben on. He must still be celebrating in the in the Grio chaos from yesterday. So I'm not sure if he's still on life support, but congrats to Ben. Uh, happy to join you. Happy to talk Memorial, man. Always fired up for this tournament. Oh, of course. Jack's Jack's tournament. I mean, we only got so many of these left in us where he's going to be handing out milkshakes and shaking hands with the winner. Raza is actually on tomorrow's show. If people are wondering where we are not breaking down the Memorial, but we do talk Grio, we talk golf, and then like an hour of absolute nonsense, including death row menu. What did you say? I said a death row menu. So when you're on death row, what do the people on death row order as their final meal? And the results will shock you. Really? Is it anything other than steak? See, that that was the popular thing that we came to the conclusion of. Like, would you just go steak? But yeah, it's like grilled chicken and carrots. Oh, come on. Get a little yeah. creative. Who's counting calories at this point? Yeah, right. You're about to be dead. Anyway, yeah. let's talk about Mirfield Village. So he, these are the bets that I got going on so far. Uh, it's probably where I'm going to be finalized at during the course of the week. So I'm going to run these by you. I ran them by Feinberg earlier, but then I committed to them and I went with it. Once you, once I made one, the dam kind of broke and you know, I got away from my original plan. The original plan was just bet Rob. Make that the only bet of the week coming in and be happy with it. But of course, I do content and I can't help myself. I can pick six guys for the same amount of money I could bet on John Rom. So I went with Vic at 22, Hideki at 40, Connors and Lowry at 50, Adam Scott at 70, and then Ryan Fox, 110 to 1 with the each way. Uh, I'm still thinking about Ricky Fowler. I mean, like, he's still on my short list, but mm-hmm. I don't know how many names. I, I, I'm still... It, I'm still convinced Rom's just going to win, although I was certain that Scheffler was going to win last week, and he probably should have won, but, you know, I didn't bet him, so I was kind of happy that he didn't win. Not that any of my guys won, but I get that same sort of vibe with Rom this week. Yeah, totally. And Scheffler, like you mentioned, it feels like he's on this epic run where he's seemingly failed to capitalize somehow on just ridiculous ball striking numbers and turn it into actual wins. Uh, It feels like he's close, but, yeah, I mean, we know Rom. You know, before the obviously the the famous COVID withdrawal, he was gaining like a stroke every 2.1 holes on the field here. It was like one of the most dominant performances I've ever seen through three rounds. Um, and yeah, we're getting this weird spot again where Scheffler's really popular. He's the highest priced guy. He's the highest on the odds board. And somehow it feels kind of similar to the Masters where have we just forgotten about John Rahm, who's very close second. It's funny because I actually went in on Scheffler at the Masters, and of course he couldn't putt that week. Is it? I don't want to say is it weird because we know that guys fluctuate in their putting. But do you find it strange that he can go from being the best putter in the field to the worst? And just like what when he's hot, it lasts like two months, and when he's cold, it lasts eight months. Like it's really bizarre. It is. And he kind of has the same thing around the green in many cases I've noticed as well. Like there are tournaments where he's absolutely phenomenal and I'm like, this guy's the best hands in the world. And then we'll have tournaments where he's like 30 percent getting things out of the bunker and sand saves. So um, up and down. But yeah, T to green, he's he's on an, an outrageous uh, stretch right now. And and I feel like it's coming um, six to one, seven to one is a lot in a field of this magnitude, as we know. Um, but it's starting to feel like that's that's the move in today's age of betting. So what do you I mean, would you bite the bullet on a Scotty Scheffler at six and a half to one, seven to one? 
Yeah, I'm not there. I'm more like probably how you traditionally play it. So I have right oh, now. Don't, uh, spoiler, don't do that. That will lose you money. <laughs> well, I've had a pretty good run and a pretty good success run lately. Maybe I'm just making the right dart throws, but I like Spieth. Um, I like Matt Fitzpatrick, both at 40 to one. I'm close on whether it's going to be Hideki or Justin Thomas for my third ad from the top. But I feel like, you know, 120 man field. These guys are not playing that poorly. If you can somehow get a Scheffler, you know, even or minus a couple strokes putting, it opens up these guys and, you know, they're five X the betting price number that you're going to get on a Scotty or a Rom. And you can take basically three of them, uh, maybe even four for the price of one. That's what I always talk myself into. And then the guy at the top just wins. I'm like, oh, yeah, should have just bet that guy. Should have just done that. Yeah, that's the way this season's been working out. Although it's been starting to turn a little bit recently. Like Mm -hmm. Brooks Brooks was 20 to one. We just had a 100 to one winner. Who won the Byron Nelson? Day. Like Day was a very obvious choice. Now, of course, I didn't bet him. But when you went and kind of retroactively looked at everything going in, like that made the most sense that Day would win. Yeah. And we're on this stretch right now where what I've noticed is there we're seeing signs right from these players. And then they have this huge colossal letdown where they're very highly owned. They're very popular on betting cards and they have this one bad week. Like it was Wyndham Clark in Mexico, like burned everyone comes out and wins the Wells Fargo. Jason J the Jason day, excuse me, then burned everyone at the Wells Fargo comes out and wins the following week. So we're kind of on this run. Grio was very popular a few weeks ago. Now gets it done at the Charles Schwab. So maybe it's just time to like, look at a guy in, in who was, you know, all signs are pointing to terrific form, but may just have let some people down last week. And you may be able to catch a decent bettering number. Cam Davis, the winner of the Memorial. Then it's a great choice, man. It's a great choice. He was what, down steam from like i haven't seen anyone steam from 70 to one opening number to like a 28 to one closing number and now we're back here in triple digits the following week so you never know and maybe he's the guy to end up doing this we know like he's another like super hot than super cold type player and it seems to be i mean pete die courses play all the cam davis you can ever get but outside of that it's like five terrible tournaments to one really good one but there's no real in between it's like sixth place or 120th yeah he's gonna let you know right away it's kind of like sam burns where you're gonna know in like the first 12 holes whether he's gonna be around on sunday or not should that be the sam burns betting strategy just to kind of like dip your toe into the water make sure he's not eight over par after the front nine on thursday and be like okay now i can bet him yeah maybe you just get him in live at that point once they're showing some signs of life and it's interesting like we i talked about this a little bit on my show last week House players have these polar opposites. Like I, we talked about the case of like Burns versus Sung Jay. Both are usually relatively like the same odds, right? And one of them seemingly has so much more value, in my opinion, it's Sam Burns in an outright betting market. He's won five times since May of 2021. Sung Jay has zero wins. But if you're looking at like a top 20 market or a DFS play or something like that, Sung Jay seems to be so much more consistent and makes so much more sense. If they had a head to head matchup with those two every week, Sung Jay is probably winning that 65 percent of the time. But yet Burns is the one who gets those outright wins. So I think it's just being selective and having an understanding of the player that you're taking and, and what markets are best to play them in. FantasyNational.com slash Mayo will get you that 20% off. I've just pulled it up on the screen right now. Sungjae versus Burns. And when you take a look at it in the overall numbers over the past 24 rounds, Sungjae rates out to be 46th in this field. And Sam Burns is 83rd. And it kind of tracks. Well, there's no way you're playing. Sungjae is going to win this week because absolutely no one can play him anymore after the last two weeks. You, you know, he may be a great one to mention a la Wyndham Clark and Jason Day in that sort of realm, because it seems like there's this narrative now where Sung Jay can't win anymore. Right. Versus three weeks ago, we were all betting him. He goes over. He wins in Korea. He he misses the cut and blows like plus 11 at the PGA Championship. So he may be a good one to turn to. I'm seeing 35 to one right now on DraftKings, which is one of the better numbers we've seen on Sung Jay in the last month or so. I mean, he flamed out last week at Colonial, too. He lost five totally. strokes on approach. Totally. But this is a place where um, he's had some good track runs before. He's great around the greens. Like this should be a decent setup for his type of game. I I meant to ask you about this course in general. So, yeah, he was top 10 here a year ago, gained in all four facets at Mirfield Village. When you have a course that's so difficult in terms of 
around the green bunker play. And even if you're just trying to approach from the rough, like the longest proximity from a hundred or hundred yards and in of any course on the tour, do you think that plays more to the better around the green players and the better sand players, or is it just so challenging that it kind of mitigates that skill a little bit where you just get random dudes who probably one chip in from Corey Connors. And all of a sudden it looks like he's savant by the numbers around the green where it's just, it's such deep rough that guys are going to get lucky. Guys are going to get unlucky, but no one's really like sticking it to an inch and tapping it in. It's all about just get it inside 10 feet and hopefully you make your putt. Yeah, I think this is a place that for me, I, I lean a little bit more around the green on tougher courses like Augusta and here and places that show the propensity to reward that sort of skill set. Um, I It's interesting because there are always those examples and those outliers that pop up when you look at it. But even last year, like with Billy Horschel, you know, he struck it really well. He had an all time week. But if you look at where he made the difference between him and the bottom and the next four guys on the leaderboard, it was around the green. He gained over a stroke per round better than those guys around the green. Everything else from T to green was pretty much level. He had a great putting week, but so did those other guys. The difference if you want to win a golf tournament ultimately comes from being able to get up and down for par on Sundays and maybe chip one in throughout the week. And all of a sudden you have yourself a win. I get that, but like I see, looking at it last year, Denny McCarthy gained seven strokes around the green. That's seemingly <laughs> impossible to do. Then Cam Smith, Horschel, Wyndham Clark, Grio. Like, I mean, Clark's all right around the green, but I wouldn't call him like a great around the green player. Right. And and like I'm just looking it's... at Gr- I'm looking at Grio right now. Like Grio is not a great around the green player, but just like you have a chip in or two, it wildly skews the numbers. I guess Wyndham Clark is pretty good. He's kind of up and down, but like Cam Smith, that makes a lot of sense. We go back and look at it like Billy Horschel, you know, hot and cold, but better hot than cold. I, I just I feel like the thick rough and we see this at U.S. Opens and we just saw it at the PGA Championship. And one of the reasons why like victors around the green numbers aren't terrible at majors is that I think the difficulty is so high that it takes away from the best player's ability to utilize that skill because the rough tends to be so long at majors and at Mirfield Village. I would agree there. There are certain, well, it kind of depends on the major. I would say like Southern Hills and what we just saw uh, it, on some of the short runoff areas, Southern Hills and Augusta with all the short grass, like that's where Victor really struggled. That's where Colin Morikawa really struggles. But you make a great point on places like Brookline or Oak Hill with this really thick rough right on the green side. It does kind of like allow them to just sort of stab at it and play their little bump and run shot and tends to mitigate some of the guys who are really, really good in that area and levels the playing field. And then they're able to take advantage with their elite ball striking ability. Let's talk some one and done since Tambo is not on the show this week. You can see my awful teams up here. Uh, I was doing well in one and done and now I'm not doing so well in the one and done. Everyone's just coming to take my money. So the Mayo Tambo team is in second place of the four teams that I have, nine million for the year. We need to make a move. We got no Scotty, no Rob, no Cantley, no Rory. That's not great. No Hatton or Morikawa. So the best players that we have available right now are Xander and Victor Hovland, and then Jason Day, Sung Jay, Corey Connors, Fowler, and Cam Young, then Russell Henley. And then everyone else is just kind of gone. So we've been using our good players, we just haven't been using them in the right spots. It's funny what you said about Sung Jay. Maybe Sung Jay is the play. I just don't think that anyone like we're not in the money right now. We need to come back somewhere. If Sung Jay can come first, second, or third, all of a sudden we're gonna laugh everyone. I can't imagine he's more than one percent owned this week. You're right. And this is an interesting week, too, where you have obviously the elevated field structure of big time paydays, only 120 guys. So a smaller field size at an invitational only type tournament. So I think it's a place where you can really get aggressive. Like ultimately. Like you said, at this point in the season, I think it comes down to how much ground do you need to make up or are you playing it a little safer? I think Victor and Xander make the most sense given the payout, given the shorter field, given how both of them are kind of playing right now. Um, but yeah, if you need to make a move, Sungjae or maybe Justin Thomas. Like, I don't think anybody's going to play Justin Thomas this week. I can see that. I've already played Justin Thomas. I used him when he okay. sucked at the Farmers Insurance Open because... Those are things that I do. Maybe I will go with Xander or Victor in this tournament. Like Victor is only available in 42% of leagues in the big one and done in the race for the Mayo Cup. Xander is only available in 37%. So they can only be so owned at some point. Like even if 20% of the people you that can use Victor do use Victor, 
you know, we're still below 10% at that point. Yeah, exactly. I think Xander's a good play. Honestly, I, I've been this person the last couple of years when I look back that I've been betting Xander at this event. I've always thought it's set up great for him. You know, he's got no finish worse than 18th since in the last 11 years here, which was last year, which is his worst finish, 18th, 18th, 2nd, 4th, 4th, 10th, 8th. He's got no finish worse than 18th in his last five times at this particular course. So the incoming form, while he doesn't really seem to be like he's really in contention in Sundays, he's putting together these good finishes, but he's kind of like off at the back end of the coverage and making a little bit of a run up the leaderboard. But I think the form is better than the eyeball test would tell you because we just haven't seen him much. And this, I think it's just ultimately a great course spot for him that he's going to get a win here, I think, sometime in his career. No, I went to go use Sung Jay. I'm going to use Xander. Uh, so Xander is going to be the official pick of Team Mayo Tambo or Team Mayo Joe this week. Uh, every time we've had a guest on to help us help me pick and Tambo hasn't been here, it has not gone well. I think I'm going to use Justin on. Thomas on the team I need to use. to. That's in like last that I need to use to catch up. I could use a win here. I'm not going to lie to you. Maybe Xander can come through. I wish I usually I try to structure it that I use one of my one and done with one of my bets so I can double cash him. Maybe I can spread the love out a little bit with this you ready to jump into DraftKings? let's do it buddy so what do you make of how the pricing came out where you have scheffler at the very top as we talked about i don't know why that's showing up like that that's weird there we go scheffler 11-3 rom 11,000. rory is still 10-6 he's sandwiched there with cantley and xander it sounds like you kind of want like would you feel comfortable with xander as your first man in? yes i I think that most people are going, and I'm not great in ownership, hand up, but I think most people are going to gravitate to Scheffler and Xander here. Uh, I'm so, excuse me, Scheffler and Cantlay. Um, I feel comfortable with Xander. I wonder if, like, the ultimate zig move, if you're trying to win, like, something like the Pat Mayo Experience Open with a bunch of entries in it, if you go Rory, because he's at such this weird price where it doesn't align with the betting market as the number three guy on the board. It doesn't really align with his form. He's not great here, but is that kind of the opportunity where you say, okay, this guy's a top five player in the field. Maybe he can get it right. And if he does, I feel like there's going to be so little exposure to him elsewhere. I'll have such a leg up on the field. Um, I wonder in some of the bigger contests if I don't end up with him in like one of my one of my three lines. So the first lineup that I built, uh, it's up on the screen right now, was basically a mock of the lineup that won last year when it was <laughs> like the complete balance build that also included Billy Horschel. I had like I think Brendan Grace was <laughs> in that lineup. Like it was kind of crazy. But I have Connors, Fowler, Lowry, Matsuyama, Scott, and Thigala. Like that sounds great, but it lacks the punch of any of those top guys. And my problem is this week we go to create a lineup. If we start with, let's say we start with Rom, because I like Rom better than Scheffler. I think it's a coin flip, but let's say I'm good with just going with Rom. Um, and we'll enter we're going entering the mini max here. I did well in the mini max last week. I haven't refined everything yet, but went back to my 150 strategy. Probably could have used more than 22 players across 150 lineups, but. You know, most of them made the cut, so it worked out well. If we use ROM, we have 7,800. So here becomes the predicament. I like a lot of these guys in the $8,000 range. Me too. Who, who do I like below that is the problem. And it's like, it's Ben Ann. Who, who doesn't love Ben Ann this week? Mm -hmm. Gotta love Ben Ann this week, uh, showing up to Memorial. But there's some other guys in there. Like, I don't know how popular you think Ben Ann's going to get. I would guess pretty popular because I just don't see a lot yeah. of names that stick out from down here. Like Patrick Rogers rates out great for me. Why? I don't know. Apparently he hits every green regulation, but can't ever make cuts or win. But I'm going to use him. I'm going to use Ryan Fox because I looked into it. He's just playing great golf. And yeah. I think that yes. he is a better player than, as Feinberg pointed out to me, like, like I, said, I love Bez. I love Hadwin, Dietrich. Like Fox is a better player than those guys. Agreed. And like below that, now we're looking at Justin Su, who you're relying on his putting. Like Jagger has been great, but this is a much different field for Jagger. Although we kind of pulled it out a little bit at the PGA Championship. And then I get into the sixes and I'm like, I have no clue. Batia, I'll use, but that's it. Yeah, right there under Jaeger, it, it starts to get a little hairy. Justin Davis Riley, like I want to bet, but he's just been awful since getting that win with Nick Hardy. Um you know, Svensson and Cole are right there, man. Svensson is sneaky. So I had this thing where I'm like, only play Svensson on short courses. Like it's under 7,200 yards, 
plug in Adam Svensson. You're locked in for a top 15. Then he like showed up to Quail Hollow. Then he played pretty well at the PG. Like, I think he's just actually turning himself into a really good player. And it's starting to come around with the putter in terms of a little bit of confidence. And he's just a flusher with his irons. So maybe this is a decent spot for him too. I like the model that I ran, he's he's 20th. So he, well, I mean, too bad this isn't the Memorial Health because he came 18th there in 2021. He was 45th at this tournament a year ago. And it's funny because he was flushing it with his irons. He's been brutal with his irons in his last two yeah. starts at Quail in the PGA Championship. And he's gaining an average of over five strokes on the greens all of a sudden. And this is yeah. from a guy who, at the century, lost almost nine strokes. Then the next week at the Sony, lost four and a half. Like, the putting has, has been a lot better, though. Maybe it is Svensson to look at. Although it seems like when he does gain with his irons, I guess Arnold, like Bay Hill's a pretty long course, but Honda's mm-hmm. short. The players are short. Heritage yes. is short. Sony is short. RSM is short. That's where yep. he picked up a ton of those like high numbers and strokes gained approach. The driving has been better. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about him, but I'm going to have to figure something out down here. Won't I? Yeah, he. I mean, he's up and down, but so are all the guys in the 6K range once we start to get to there. I just think he poses as much upside in terms of a top 20 finish as any of these guys down here. At 6,500, like Batia's down here. I'm going to end up yeah. betting Batia. I'll throw him on the betting card as well. I love him. I think he's going to be awesome. He's so good. And he, I saw a guy walking across the street, this mega hipster, when I was driving home from the office today. I was like, oh, he has Batia build. The dude must have weighed like 94 pounds. It's kind of crazy to see in like real life. But like the, the leverage that he can create, like with his flexibility and just his lankiness, you know, I'm very envious. I play with a guy who hits the ball. Uh, like I don't play with anyone who hits the ball higher. Like it's crazy. He's six foot six and just all of the leverage he has just gets down on the ball when it goes direct every single club. I'm out here hitting like you know, a five iron and it's essentially like a line drive every single yeah. time. Like I'm a, I'm a pretty short guy and that's like all of the oomph I got behind it with my little tiny T-Rex arms. And he's just, you know, very casually five iron, pure apex height. And I feel like Batia is very much the same. And the irons have been really good for me. He had a really bad final round at Colonial, which I didn't like. By the numbers here that I'm looking at, past 24 rounds in my modeling, uh, Hubbard rates out really well, and so does Sam Stevens. Do you have any interest in those guys? Um, I have Sam Stevens start here, and you know, top five, or excuse me, top 10 in driving distance. He's really good from the proximity ranges that I'm looking at. There's like 6,500. There's some noise. Ekroth's kind of playing well all of a sudden again. Alex Noren has been like kind of okay for me last week. He has a couple, I believe he has an eighth place finish at the Memorial going back a couple of years. Neesmith has been trending in the right direction. There's a lot of good players, but I agree with you. I think the guy for me that I'm most interested in is Batia. It's going to depend on like how the ownership numbers come out as the week progresses, but I love his moxie. I love his just going for it. There were some holes. I was so impressed in Mexico when he's playing with Rom and Finau, where they were kind of sort of clubbing back and hitting four iron out to the fairway. And Batia is just sending driver down the middle. So I love players that sort of play with that aggressiveness. I feel like that's what you need and ultimately to to capture a victory and i think that he's on that path mark hubbard's approach numbers the past four tournaments are kind of outrageous (laughs) 7.3 last week top 10 at charles schwab he gained 0.5 at the pga championship whatever he lost five and a half strokes putting which is pretty atypical for him wells fargo 4.1 mexico 7.3 the heritage where he came 11th he gained two should we be playing Mark. It seems like we should be, should be playing Mark Hubbard and like he sucks off the tee, but I don't think that distance really means anything this week to tell you the truth. Like guys lay up on par fives here. You can't go for them in two. We've seen a yeah. bunch of short hitters win at Jack's course in our lifetimes. Yep. Like I'm really not sweating distance this week. Duffner, Ling, Murth, Horschel's not exactly long. We've seen those guys. Yeah, and it's so wide off the tee. But the thing about that is, is there is such a severe penalty if you miss really wide. Like, if you're in the very first cut a couple of yards off, okay, fine. If you're hitting misses like Rory was hitting at Oak Hill, you're done out here. Um, and you mentioned you you brought up a great point since the renovation, and Rory kind of talked and spoke about this frustration last year is that um, – 
he said it just doesn't really make sense for guys to go for a lot of these par fives into, even if you're within range, the way that they sort of recontour these greens makes it very difficult. And ultimately the move can sometimes be just laying back to 80 to a hundred yards and then trying to stick a wedge in and use the slopes more properly that way to get it down close to the pin. Uh, and then there's a lot of guys that do that really well. Mark Hubbard being one of them. So Mark Hubbard, he's going in. So if I, so all of a sudden now, so let's go back to our lineup. We got Rom. Now let's throw in Hubba Hubbard. See how we're doing. So Rom and Hubbard, we got $8,100 left. So if you had $8,100 left for four guys, would your inclination to be go to like Ben Ann and then a bunch of guys in the low nines, mid eights, or would you want to get back up to like a Xander in this spot? Or, I mean, I don't, is anyone going to play Morikawa at nine, nine? Like, I don't want to bet him because he terrifies me, but feel like as a DraftKings play at low ownership, which I assume that he's going to come in with, sandwiched between Xander and Hovland and Cantley and Day, mm -hmm. like you could be looking at a 6% Morikawa here. You could be. He's not playing. I'm not. A, I know you're a guy, but uh, in terms of Morikawa, but I'm not there with him. I would rather, if you're asking me, I think I start under 900 and go with that balance, 9,000, excuse me, and go with that balance build approach that you said sort of paid off last year. I love Spieth at 8,900. I know he's going to be popular. It's okay to have one or two of those guys in your lineup, but I think Spieth on a thousand dollar savings from Colin Morikawa makes more sense to me. So if we go Spieth, that gives us 79. Is there's anyone in the mid sevens that you like? Like, would you go with a, like, do you like Ben Ann? I do like Ben Ann. Yes. There are some other guys though, right there. I mean, Harris played pretty well. Chris Kirk, I actually really like this week also. So there are some guys there that if you wanted to pivot, if his ownership gets really high, Taylor Moore's had good finishes. Um, there are options there, which could work two ways, right? It could help to sort of temper some of that ownership on Ann with those names right around him. Uh, but I'm okay with a lot of those options right there at 75, 74. So we can take Ben Ann. We can throw him in. So we can go Rom and Hubbard. Spieth and Ben Ann, Lowry and Adam Scott. How do you feel about Lowry and Scott? Love both of them in terms of DFS. I don't like them to win necessarily. I, Lowry is just one of it's. He's that guy for me. I cannot get right. And every time I get him, he'll tease me with like a 13th place finish. But I know he plays well here. Um, I don't know. How much do you put into... You know, they redid all 18 greens. Basically, in my opinion, what Jack saw happening is he like tried to Bryson proof this course with everything that Bryson was doing at the time of the renovation. If you look at sort of how it lines up, he narrowed the fairways. He's moved the bunkers down. I think he just saw this new mold of golfer coming about that was just going to bomb it over all the trouble at his course. And he's like, I have to fix this. So do you go back? Are you okay going back three, four years where someone like Shane Lowry has played awesome here? Or do you, are you treating this like a, basically a new event? See, I, I'm not, I'm treating it like it always was like okay. the same guy has continued to play well. Like can't lay one right. before and after the redesign Morikawa yeah, won the work day before the redesign. And he loses in a playoff to can't lay Rom wins it before the redesign in like the hardest tournament that I can remember in like the regular rotation you know, they renovate it and he comes out and is even better the next year. So it seems yeah, like the guys who too. play, it seems like the guys who play well just tend to play well. I just looking, yeah. I have, I have Lowry stats up on the screen right now. He's basically Scotty Scheffler, but you know, 20% worse. Okay. Well, that 20% worse with the way that Scotty's playing ain't so bad. No. And like you just look at the ball striking numbers, they're, they're gaudy. He does have like some of his off weeks. He had a really bad week at the Wells Fargo. He had a bad week at API, despite the fact that he made the cut. And at the Heritage, he lost seven. Like, Scotty loses strokes putting, but it's like three strokes putting and four strokes putting. With Shane Lowry, it's like seven strokes putting. You know, 4.2. Like, th th these are not good performances. And he's not getting like 15 strokes gained Tita Green. It's like nine and a half strokes. But it's still really good. And the price break that you're getting on him, just hoping that he can turn this around, it's not that I have the utmost faith that he's going to do it. It's not like he's been great here. He's made what four of his past five cuts. He's actually gained on the greens the past two years. He's won right. in Ohio at Firestone. So I, I think this oh. could be a really nice spot for him. And it's not that, you know, I listen, I bet him to win. He's 50 to one. You know, Scotty is seven to one or six and a half to one, depending on where you look. So I don't know. I, I think I'd rather just roll out Lowry and try to get something out of it there. Woodland's another one at 77. Like he burnt us so badly at the PGA Championship, but yes. once again, the yeah. numbers look great. 
Yeah, and he's been really good here. Let me ask you, just going kind of circling back to Lowry in this range in general. Um, he's obviously been really well in terms of strokes gain total that I looked at at Muirfield Village over the last six years and around the green at Muirfield. There's a guy a hundred bucks cheaper that's been even better. See, I interest you in Siwoo Kim? Of course, he he was like yeah. I'm trying to decide between him and Ricky as our uh, as my final guy on the betting card. I think like. I, I think it I actually like sets you. up really well. Like, even if you just look at what he does well, like the long irons are really good. We know how dialed in he can get from 100 yards and in. Like, we see it three times a year, and it's like, oh, my God, where the hell did 100%. this guy come from? And usually you you don't really think about this course in a rotation of the Siwoo courses. Like, Siwoo, I, like he's the Pete Dye master, but he's also like the Pete Dye adjacent master. So, like, mm-hmm. he wins at Sony. Well, that makes a lot of sense. It's, of course, just like Pete Dye courses in terms of length. And grass type. Oh, where else did he win? Oh, he won the Wyndham Championship. Well, of course, the same guys that play well at the Pete Dye courses do well there. Weirdly yeah. enough, when I went back and looked at research, and I have no idea why this is the case, but guys that play well at Memorial tend to play well at Sawgrass. Okay. Well, that's a great notion for Siwoo here. And, you know, gain strokes on approach and four straight off the tee and like 10 straight. So he's been really solid. It was encouraged by a 29th at the Masters this year. And, uh, you know, second place a few weeks ago at the Byron Nelson. So he's he's close. He's getting there. And we know he likes bent grass. So I, I don't know if he likes bent grass. I don't know if he likes. I don't know what Siwoo likes. Yeah, we some don't know if he likes it. Yeah, some weeks he'll show up and he will gain 10 strokes on bent grass. And then he'll go with the next week and lose 10 strokes. Like it just there's no rhyme or reason with him. There's there's little rhyme reason about Seawell. You absolutely have that right. But statistically, it's his best surface uh, in terms of Bermuda Poe event on Fantasy National here. But uh, well, that's good to know. Let's see if I scroll up, I could probably see that. Oh yeah, he he loses the fewest amount of strokes on bent than any other surface. We it, love to see it. This is the ultimate Siwu chart here. Um, st- average strokes gained by difficulty of round gains a bunch on easy courses and a bunch on hard courses. But if it's just average, he loses strokes to the field. Makes no sense. Yeah. Windy, yeah. windy AF though. Hey, maybe we'll get, <laughs> you got to play Z will. Yeah. I, I was going to go over the weather, but I think it's just too early in the week to do something like that. Right. So let me try to see if I can bring it up here. Let's see. Ownership projections. These are going to be bad right now. It's just way too early in the week doing this on a Monday evening. You know, I got to go play cabbage, yo. This is how it works. Tough times, right? I know. I, I live a tough life and people need to get this, uh, a little bit more so only 776 lineups have been generated so far so that's going to be 30,000 by the time that Wednesday comes along but just early indication show no more cow was higher than I thought no very few people seem to be playing Jason Day who's Anderkirst this week should I mention but Rory down in ownership initially day way down and then you have this like dead range Thomas M Fitz Spieth no one is playing Cameron Young, apparently, like zero people. That's hmm. surprising. And no one's playing Sam Burns. It's funny how quickly people have turned on Cameron Young. Yeah, you know, this world that we live in now is is moving very fast. So it was Cam Young and it was Sung Jay were like the two popular names like a month ago. And now no one wants to play him. Young's interesting. I've I've been very low on him all year and, and I feel like I've gotten it right, but now maybe a position to sort of buy low. If he's low owned, he's a good betting price. He still makes a ton of birdies. He's number two in distance. And was he like leading through three rounds here last year or very close to, and then he had an abomination of a Sunday, if I remember correctly. Yeah. I remember. I think he was like 10 over in one of the rounds on the weekend. He finished 60 like 84. Yeah. Yeah. He was in 84. It was, was it really Sunday? Bad. Yeah, a Sunday 84. So yeah, he was around that he so he finished seven over par. He shot an 84. That's 12 over in one round. So he was what? Five. He opened with a 67. First KH, round leader, I think. Yeah. KH Lee also shot 82 in the how hard was the final round last year? I don't remember that. It got hard because you know they redid the green. So Obviously, they're super firm and they're bouncy, but there was a ton of rain, if I remember right, early in the week that kind of softened things up. And then I do remember Sunday was like rock hard and you just almost had to land it 10 yards short of the green, no matter what club you came in, excuse me, 10 yards short of the pin. And it was like rolling up to the pin. It was it was wild. There were seven guys who shot 80 or worse last year in the final round. Brandon Wu went 80 80 on the weekend. 
Yeah, that I think it was even the year before I had in my notes here was one of the hardest Sundays that we had seen um, in terms of stroke average on the PGA Tour in history, or at least for that entire year. So um, it tends to get tough. He likes it to play tough, and it all sort of depended upon the conditions. And if it's dry, it's going to be very difficult to hold greens. Yeah, there was only two scores in the 80s in 2021. That was that's what I was thinking of. Yeah, it was Harry Higgs and Michael Thompson. But the 2020 year, I feel like if we go back to that, that was the crazy year. Yeah, so here it is the year that the year that um, Colin, I'm sorry, the year that Rom won at minus nine, the Sunday scoring average was 78 and only one player in the field broke 70 on that Sunday, which is crazy. And that was probably Fitzpatrick, right? Yeah, it was Fitzpatrick. <laughs> of course, he is the king of a- any time that you have outrageous scoring. Remember that happened at Bay Hill, too, yep. uh, the year that Hatton won. Everyone was over par. The scoring average was 76. Yeah, only one guy shot in the 60s. He wasn't. Oh, it was Matthew Fitz. But he's the new Brant Snedeker. What do you make of Fitz this week? I kind of like him. And I know that it's been a mixed bag for him. But like just seeing basically those three major champions in Fitz, Spieth, and Matsuyama um, all there at like 35 to 40 to one, all basically priced equally this week. I kind of like all three of them. I I I get... Fitzpatrick wrong all the time. So it's hard for me to really pull the trigger on him. I just look at it and I see that day and Hatton are more expensive than Justin Thomas. And the numbers suggest that's correct, but I don't believe it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what to do about that. Like, yeah, I, I I think objectively someone like Fitz, someone like me, I like Hideki, the best of the three guys that you mentioned, uh, especially because of the price that he comes in at on DraftKings. But to have Justin Thomas two hundred dollars more basically than all of those guys, like why wouldn't I just play Justin Thomas? Yeah, it feels like a good, great bounce back spot for him. Some disappointing finishes, obviously the PG. Like it, he it he's so good, and he just had a really bad approach week. I think of the PGA, which I'm actually most confident in that bouncing back. He lost one point two on approach. He almost never loses strokes on approach. He's pretty much can walk out there and gain three to four. So positive around the green, if he can sort of I'm I'm most confident in one thing, asking it to flip being the approach play with him. And I think if he does, he's probably got like a T14 floor. Go open Colin Morikawa's page for a second. Okay. And tell me how he's not doing better. I mean, the putting is clearly my God, the issue, but the rest of his game, like it's not far away. Yeah, last five starts averaging 4.9 per event <laughs> on approach is, is is up there. Yeah, no bit, no finish in the top 10. I know, it's it's kind of insane. And the yeah, courses I, where he is doing the best are the courses where you wouldn't expect him to do the best. Like, I, I, I think when it comes down to it, I know he has the two majors, some of them were longer. Actually, they weren't even longer courses. Harding Park and... With the what was the one that he won? What British Open did he win? Where was it? Oh God, it, it Royal St. George's. Yes, that's right. Yeah, like not super long courses for majors. You're not getting up to PGA Championship and U.S. Open type standards. I always thought of him of like winning a bunch of Colonials, a bunch of Heritage, the Sony Open, the Wyndham. Like he's the better version of that type of player who just dummies that type of course. But when you look at his results, the Masters, Riviera, Tory Pines. It's like okay. That seems counterintuitive. Yeah. And I was just, I'm actually looking back to it, what he did coming into that workday when he won. And he had a 64th at the Heritage where he lost strokes on approach, a miscut at the Travelers, lost three and a half on approach, and then gained 9.2 at the workday the following week. So um, it could flip pretty easily for him. He's so talented. And if anyone who can gain nine strokes on approach out here um, has to have some sort of inner confidence coming back to the same spot. Yeah, and that was the fourth week out of COVID. So he, he he missed that short putt in the playoff to lose at Colonial right. to yes. Berger. Then he kind of sucked at Heritage, sucked at Travelers. Then the next week, it was him, Vic, and Thomas down the stretch. He made that huge – it was either him or Thomas that made the huge putt in the playoff. I think they may have traded huge They putts. both did. Yeah, yeah, they both did. And then Thomas got stuck behind the tree, and that was the end of him. That was the end of it. Yeah, that was a good playoff. And then uh, what does it look like? Three or four weeks later, he won the PGA, won his first major. So it was the start of a run. 
It was, but just this is the funny thing to look at here. So the same course they played back-to-back weeks. Obviously, a much different setup with Memorial. It played longer. It didn't have, I don't think 14 was drivable or 15, whatever that one was. I mean, that's Mm -hmm. where Morikawa was doing his best work, and that's why he won at Harding Park, too. That drivable par four, I I think he eagled it and birdied it every single day. And then the one at Workday, he just went for it every single day and got it there. Exactly where he wanted to hit it well in the final round, like Vic hit it into the water, but he gained almost five strokes putting at the work day on the faster yes. greens, same course the next week lost 0.3 strokes. And this reminds me of, I'm going to bring up his uh, Riviera stats uh, for the Genesis. Uh, it was, yeah, lost 7.6 strokes on the greens in 2021 at the Genesis. The next year he came second, he gained 6.8, like, I don't understand how that correlates. I don't either. And this is why we always talk about this with putting, but this is the perfect illustration because never, maybe ever will we see again. They play the same course back-to-back weeks. I don't care if the greens are faster. It's the same course, and it was a 13-stroke swing in strokes game putting for this guy. Yeah, the last time Morikawa lost strokes on approach was last year's Players' Championship. Jeez. But, like, I can't bet him. Like, I bet Vic over him this week. But when mm-hmm. it gets down to it, like, DraftKings-wise, they might actually end up being closer in ownership than I'm giving them credit for, I think. Just because there's going to be that want, that need to play probably two of one of Scheffler and Rom and one of Cantlay and Xander. That's how it feels to me this week. Yeah, and you're right. And I think while we like... I think Vic's playing much better objectively. I think that there is this sentiment that we even heard some of last week where maybe a little bit of of fatigue from Vic and going through his biggest final round of his entire career, you know, hopping back in the next week and having to play four straight rounds and then going back across the country to Memorial. Um, it's just been a long stretch for him right now, and maybe some of that sets in to the minds of the, the players in DraftKings, and you'll get some leverage on Morikawa. Well, he's Vic has never finished better. I mean, I've bet him this week. I probably should have looked at this. He's never finished better than 47th at this event. But at that work day, he was third and was he gained 15 strokes to the green. <laughs> Man, that was one of the weeks where uh, Feinberg probably had him to win by three because those are the weeks you're looking for. No, I mean, those are usually the weeks I actually had him and Morikawa. That I mean, back when I was coming out of COVID was probably the best thing that ever happened to me slash I mean, it wasn't the worst but we gained so many new viewers of the show because golf was the only sport around and i think we hit like four of the first six winners coming out of covid back when i used to hit people who win then i sucked all these people into watching the show it's like hey this guy prints money i may have not hit a winner since yeah you guys sucked me in i was watching before but what really sucked me into a weekly viewership was will it as i'm sure so many of your oh, viewers yeah. would attest to that moment yeah epic moment w- will it had a run here during that super difficult year in 2020 but i i think he got gobbled up by sunday i had a will it i remember a will it top 20 that i he made like a terrible double bogey from the fairway on 18 that cost me that but um he's another guy like really good around the greens like they i don't know jack's sort of owed to augusta people will say this week and he's just really really savvy in terms of around the green work um it may be another person to look at what's his price yeah i think he's like 6500 he's been bad recently yeah he has he has so let's see will it is yeah 6300 dollars you gonna play mcgirt former champ nope not gonna play mcgirt i'm out let's see here can't lay is there a world where you just fade can't lay um interesting uh i think it will depend on the numbers as they come out later in the week but i probably am to be honest with you i'm gonna play my my typical you know three or four lineups and i will have some rory i'm going to have some xander lineups in which case i probably avoid can't lay there i gotta use ekro too he's been too good really good 6,600 for Eckroat. Okay. So I, I've just, I mean, I haven't really clicked on anyone at the top yet, which is kind of the issue here. I like Rom, so we're going to add Rom into the pool. Let's try to build a Rom and Scotty lineup. See how that works. I'm going to enter, okay. I'm going to enter this one right now. This, this Rom Hubbard lineup, Hubba Hubbard. But now we're probably going to have to go with what? Three guys in the sixes to make that work, do you think? Yep. How do you feel about Ben Griffin? Is his sort of run over? It feels like it's over. We, we see this with guys every year, right? Where 
They had like Eric Cole had his hot stretch and then it was over. Maybe, yeah. maybe he's better than I'm giving him credit for, but like the results have not been good for him. Like the last time he finished inside the top 20 was at the API where he gained yeah. four, four and a half strokes chipping and three putting. Agree with you there. It's probably over. He just didn't initially caught my eye as someone who rated out pretty well because I have a, a heavier than normal emphasis on around the green play, and he's fourth in the field over the last 36 rounds. But you're right. The results would uh, would indicate that the run is sort of coming to a close here. I think, though, if you got to go with guys in the 60s, like we got to go Batia, right? Yeah. So the, here are the guys that I have. Four of them starred right now. Eckroat, Stevens, Hubbard, and Batia. I like... Eckroat and Batia, but those are probably the two most popular ones also. But I don't think anyone's going to stack Rom and Rom and Scheffler. Oh, man. Goderup's in this field? Let's go. Oh, Snedeker. I he was is. just asking if Snedeker had retired or not. Apparently, he has not. Where the hell has he been? I don't know. But Goderup got the invite because he won the Nicholas Award or something last year. So he got... It, it, I was hoping I was thinking we were going to see a lot more of him this year in terms of sponsor invites and stuff like that. But kind of Batia scooped them up and Whoever else, Michael Block or whoever else gets the them each every every week. Let's see. Got her up. We can click on his world golf ranking or we can just click on him right here. Yeah. Snedeker hasn't played since the Fortnite. Weird. Unless he's playing is, on the he lose his card. He must have. I thought he would have had enough status as guy who's won a bunch on the PGA <laughs> tour. What's David Lingworth doing? Is he shown up a couple of times? I, I played flat. him last week. He was like, nah, if it wasn't for Michael Block, I think he would have been in the last. I tried. I made Sixth the hard the sell players. on Tambo. <laughs> oh, did you? Okay. Let's see. Goderip has been 47th, 22nd, 17th, 5th, 18th on Corn Ferry. Well, he really had a letdown at the Astrara Chili Classic. Or the, he was T48 at the Club car championship at the Landings Golf and Athletic Club. Okay. He's not missing cuts, though. I mean, I love Goddard, yeah. but this this feels like too difficult of a tournament for him. Yeah, I think you're better off. Those $6,500 guys, we, they've been playing PGA Tour events and been playing much better. Stevens, Necrode, Batia, even Neesmith, Hubbard. Um, I, I think those are the plays. Yeah, and it's not even like Snedeker's been playing on the Corn Ferry Tour. He like, legit hasn't played. Since his T fifty nine, at the end of the the first event of the swing season was the last time he must have been hurt. Must be hurt. And you know, he was bad last year too. Bad. T fourteen at the American Express last year had a T eighteen at Valero, and then no finish better than T forty eight. God, it's Mainly gone. It goes time. quickly. When it goes, it goes with these guys. Yeah, that's kind of crazy. And he's still eight years away from the senior tour, so that's not good for him. What about Revy, 62? Uh, you know what? I was looking at him because he's had some good finishes here. Where did I see that? Um... He's playing like okay. Not great, but okay. He's putting somehow. Like they, they, they Just look at his putting stats. They make no sense. Yeah. He spent two so looks... years losing strokes in every tournament. Now he's gained an eight straight. And it was so back to back 40th place finishes. And then it was the double up year um, work day memorial. He had a 22nd and a 17th back to back there. So that was the last time he played it. He hasn't played the last two years. And probably didn't get into the field. But I guess he won. Did he win last year, two years ago? One of them. But yeah, to look at it, like in the key proximity yeah. ranges, like over the past 24 rounds, his long irons have just been electric. Fourth from over 200 yards, second from 175 to 200. And he's not a long hitter. So most of his approaches are going to be from that range. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're all coming from that exam range. Although he's picked up a little bit of steam. I've seen him on uh, on Instagram or something like that doing the speed training. You know what I was going to ask you because I forget what happened. I know we're kind of jumping all over the place, and that's my fault for being a bad guest. But how did Hideki get DQ'd here last year? Do you remember the situation? <sighs> I don't. Was it that bridge shot? That yeah, he was, it, like was, it, was it was something to do with him and a bridge. That's all I remember. And I don't think his ball was floating down the bridge. Oh, huh. I noticed that. I'm like, how did he? I don't even remember how he got DQ'd. I, oh, I, think, I do remember what it was. Oh, he it changed was the, the driver to the three wood. It was the, it was the, the white, white out on the. Yeah, it was the white out on the three wood. Yeah, that was dumb. Golf's fucking yeah, stupid, man. That was dumb. Yeah. 
All dumb right, golf rules. There's so many of them. Let's try to dig back in, try to find MJ Duffy is someone that I think just, I mean, I, I can go look at his numbers, but I feel like he just plays better at harder courses. Yeah, I've never really played Duffy. Um, I, I played him at the U.S. Open one year, and I think he was leading for, I think it was last year's U.S. Open. Yeah, he came 31st. He tailed off on the weekend. Like, he has no really good finishes, but, like, Nicholas course, 21st at Honda, 19th at Valspar, 15th at Valero. Like, he shows up from time to time. Like, Wells Fargo's a pretty tough course. He came 47th. He generally has a good Thursday, and then he, it all goes to shit for him. But yep. I don't think he's a bad, but he's been bad recently in terms of approach. Maybe stay away from him. Chez, I think I got to play, though. 62, yeah. the numbers look good. I don't mind Chez. I think going with the shorter hitters might be good, but I actually like Brendan Todd a little bit this week also, who's been playing pretty well and had some good finishes here. So uh, those guys who are able to sort of clean up around the greens and just hit fairways because there's so much with, I think there's 11 holes with water on them. And while everyone's going to look at the width of the fairways, but you get offline here and there's as many doubles as I've seen anywhere. And there are just, there's always like these guys who make eight and nines at Memorial. So there are big numbers lurking. And I think if you can just kind of keep a steady play, plus when you add in four par fives that there, it's a weird spot where there really isn't an advantage to being incredibly long. Like there is of course built in, but if you can lay up to a hundred yards, it frustrates a lot of those longer hitters, which they've spoken about. So guys like Reavy and Todd, get them to a hundred yards and they're going to have great birdie looks as, as good as the guys who are, you know, trying to chip from around the greens. Uh, I have Streelman pulled up right now. He's $6,700. I think that he'll end up being popular this week off the heels of two top twenties, a top 10 last week, but just looking at the numbers, he seems like such fool's gold, like five strokes gained around the green at Wells Fargo, 6.2 stroke gain putting last week. Like those are not things Kevin Streelman does well. Like you want Kevin yeah. Streelman to hit every fairway and be awesome with his irons. And he hasn't really done those things in combination with each other since last year's Barbasol. Yeah, yeah. I I don't I don't know if I'm feeling it with Streelman this week. Where's where? What's his price point? Sixty seven. Sixty seven. Where did they price Sam Bennett? Did Bennett they give? Is, is he? Yeah, Bennett is sixty three. Okay. Any interest in that coming off the Masters for you or no? I forgot this guy existed. <laughs> you didn't. <laughs> I, I totally forgot who this guy was. Oh, the only guy I and I completely forget his name. Uh, who was the amateur at the Masters that everyone played and he gained like a million strokes off the tee and missed the cut? Oh, um, Sergeant. Sergeant yeah. 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 Sergeant Gordon. Yeah. That guy. Yeah, Sergeant Gordon. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, should we be playing? Like, should we be looking into Sam Bennett? I don't know. He's 6,300 bucks. He's obviously pretty damn good. So, I, I mean, I just, but there are, this is one of those weeks with the shorter field. I think that, like, we've talked about it a number of times, but if you, I think you can circle those guys in the 6,500 range and they have legit, like, top 30 upside. And if you've got to take one of them, I think that's what you're looking for out of them. Yeah. I, I and it's funny that Batia might end up being the most popular because he is by far the riskiest of all those guys. I Sam Very Stevens true. probably is the most, has the most risk, but like, Mark Hubbard's just a solid player. Like he's a he's a PGA professional player. But you could I could see him winning this event a la William McGirt the year that he won. Like he's that like if I was to put him into a category, like McGirt was good. It wasn't great, but yeah, like, oh, he won this tournament. Okay. Yeah, Streelman early indication shows Smalley, Eric Cole, and none are none are above 10%. So don't go crazy on me here. But okay. Streelman, Eckrote. That's kind of it. Reavy at 4%, like whatever. That's fine. Then no one. Lingmirth, 1.7%. So yeah. It seems like Streelman's... Like Hubbard. What's, that? what's Hubbard? Hubbard is 4.9. Okay. What about Matt Hughes? Like we hadn't even mentioned him. An actual fantasy national golf lineup generated lineup so far. 0% of. He's good. <laughs> Around the green, like he's a good player. He always plays best at the courses where you don't expect him to play well. Yeah. Hey, Jack Nicholas design at the Honda. That's kind of his jam. That kind of is. I mean, he can putt. This we know. Yeah, this we know. Yeah, around the green, he's top 10 also. And in that super difficult year, he came sixth. He's a good player. He's, I mean, he's a good player for $6,500 in a 120-man field. Like, he, he's... You can click him. 
All right. So let's let's build these lineups before I let you get out of here. Are we past your time yet? No, we're good. I'm good. We're good. We got we got ten minutes. Yes. All right. So hopefully we'll be done before then. So Scheffler and Rom, let's go. It seems like I like more. The more I talk it through, the more I like Hubbard of all these guys. So Scheffler, Rom, Hubbard. Now that gives us seven thousand for the final remaining three spots, or we can use like Revy and get back up to that Siwoo Scott territory. Because really right like now, Siwoo. right now we're stuck with like Dietrich, Jagger, and Hostler. And like, I don't see, I, listen, I, I think Dietrich and Hoygaard are good and Patrick Rogers are good, but like, are they, is the com, the combination of three of those guys, is that better than Shez, Ben Ann? And I only gets us up to 76. That's still not very good. We might have to play three 6K guys. Ugh. That's tough. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah. Um. Oh, no. So, yeah, it's, it's I think we got to click Chez. You got to, you almost got to, or, or Scheffler, Rom, Hubbard, or Scheffler, Rom, Chez, let's say. All right, it gets a 72. That means, oh, yeah, I can use all the guys I like from this area. Fox, Rogers, and then you have a choice between Hoagie, Taylor Moore, KH Lee, Bez, Hadwin. Why is Hadwin $7,200? What the hell does Hadwin do? Nothing. Is he that much better than Mackenzie Hughes? Really? No, he came 13th of the players. Great. Congratulations, Adam Hadwin. Uh, and we can play your boy Svensson. Yeah. Is, he, is Hadwin that much better than Svensson? I'd already no. know. Like, yeah. All the Canadians are the same player except for Corey Connors. Yes. Agreed. And Connors, could be good. Connors could be great here. Like, he showed these hard golf courses where puts an increased emphasis on just like long irons and just hitting fairways consistently. And when he misses a fairway, it's by like a yard. So, and well, that's why I bet him here under the impression, like under the assumption that if you, well, I mean, the best way to protect your short game here is just hit greens of regulation, which we know he's going Correct. to do take the, take the 60 degree out of his hand. But if it does mitigate the ability of the good around the green players to fall back a little bit and the bad players to go up a little bit, I think that's why we see him do well at API and major championships because he hits a ton of greens. So he doesn't have to chip that often. And when he does, he can't quite fuck it up. Like he does at normal places. And to be honest, bet I was actually quite impressed by how long he sort of held on to that at Oak Hill. Like he putted the lights out. He was really good. His speed was awesome. If they weren't going in, they were right on the edge. I mean, I know he gained five strokes putting and we can't always expect that, but I'm looking at four straight starts because the stats aren't here for the Masters where he's gained over two strokes on approach, and that's kind of the norm for Corey. So it wouldn't surprise me if he if he has a big number up there again this week. Well, I hope he wins because I, I bet him to win, and that would always be nice for me. So you talk about playing like three max. You're only going to play like four or five lineups. You don't have to commit yourself to this lineup, but that's the final thing that I want to do is walk through that type of lineup for that this week. And Tambo and I have talked about like the different strategies that you need to take and giant GPPs versus a three max or a single entry. Like you don't need to get too. Cr- we don't need to be playing Shez Revy in a single entry. We just don't. Yes. No, so where no, would I don't you think I go that low? So where would you want to start here? Like, do you think that the Rory Xander start or is this one where you would start with Xander? I think I, my, most comfortable one would be just starting with Xander and kind of going balanced and trying to eat up as many guys who I think can actually like win. Like to me, there's a big difference like Adam Scott and Siwoo right there at 8K, right? When you drop down $500 and you get to English, Horschel, Kuchar, like I think you are having a massive drop off in 500 bucks in terms of win equity where you don't really have as much of a, a drop off up top. So I think if you can start with Xander and then maybe go Spieth at 8,900 and then just try to eat up those balanced guys. And if somehow like all of a sudden Siwoo Kim like ships this thing, then you are like live because you have two other players who are pretty good locks for a top 10. We didn't mention Tom Kim at all at 79. We've talked about shorter players being good at mm-hmm. this course historically. We go look at Tom Kim's numbers. They're shockingly better than you may think recently. He just can't putt. 
He can't putt anymore. Yeah. And he's not scoring on the par fives, which I think are huge. Like you basically, even when you look at the good, the years where the scoring has been relatively low, um, that's where all your birdies are going to come from. If you can play the rest of the course level par and go like three under on the par fives, it's 12 under throughout the tournament. That's good enough to win a lot of years. I'm playing Tom Kim in my lineups this week, just for people to know. And I think that he's going to be a fantastic pivot play. If we just look at him right now, Tom Kim, 3%. Yeah, like people are wow. playing. Listen, I love Russell Henley as much as the next guy, but he shouldn't be 4X what Tom Kim is. No, no, not not at the same price. No way. No. And like, do you have a take between Cameron Young or Sam Burns? Because legit, no one is playing those guys. Oh, geez. In DFS, I would prefer Cameron Young in this spot because I feel like you're getting a break in terms of price off a couple of bad weeks. And I just burns I, I love to bet burns when they creep him up to those 40 to 50 to 1 numbers which they love hanging on him which have proven to just be like if he's 50 to 1 just take him and you're gonna miss six or seven cuts when you take that bet but if you hit it once a year you're gonna pay it all back um i would prefer in dfs cameron young though so if you go xander and spieth to start your yes. lineups you have four spots for seventy seven hundred dollars so again thinking of the idea of three max or single entry, where do you think the next logical play is? Ben Ann? So my strategy usually, Pat, and I don't know how this may differ with some people or if this is like sound in its sense, hey, but I you're usually, the guest. usually take my... We, we were taking you at your word. You are correct because you are the guest. <laughs> I take my top two and then I go get my bottom guy. So in this sense, since I'm trying to build balance, I would go Xander, Spieth, and then let's throw... Svensson in there and see what that leaves me. So Svensson at 69 would be your favorite of the lower end guys. Like you wouldn't want to go down to Batia Hubbard, probably too risky. I just don't think that I'm going to have to, but we can like, we can relook at it if I need to um, once the other guys are filled in. But I think with Svensson, given that I didn't take any of the top four and then I skipped the whole nine K range, I think I'm okay with one guy at 6,900. So if you go with Svensson, you have three spots at 8,000 meaning you could go Scott, Siwoo, Tom Kim if you wanted to. <laughs> yep, I love that. I love Scott and Siwoo. Um, so the problem is now you only have $8,000 left. You can't get to your $100 short of Lowry. Hmm, that is an issue. Now, if you What's turn... Denny McCarthy get me? Maybe I'll play McCarthy. I mean, then, then you have 400 left on the table. So what if McCarthy and Scott? Instead of Siwoo? Yes. So McCarthy, you you like Denny that much? I do. I always like Denny. He's just played. He's, dude, he's been really, really solid. Okay. So if you go Denny and Scott instead of Siwoo and Scott, you're left with $8,400, which means you can get up to the Gala Connors, that level. Connors. So that leaves you with $100. So you could upgrade Svensson into... Hoygaard, Jaeger, Hostler, or Buckley, if you wanted. But, uh, I'd, I'd keep Svens in there. I'll leave the 100 on the table and stay with Svenny. All right, that's an interesting build. Obviously not what I would do, but I never win, so I think I might have to like replicate this sort of strategy. It's the Denny, the Denny piece I don't love. I think I yeah, would just... Yeah, that's the one that's tough, but I think that gets me to Thigala or Connors, which I like both of them, and then I could easily, depending on ownership there, I'm okay taking the lower-owned guy between Scott and Siwoo. Like, if Scott is an extra 5% owned, I'm just... I'm I'd, Like, those two are interchangeable to me. I would take Siwoo at 5% less ownership. Who do we get it? See, I, I think to feel like you went Scott, Denny, and Connors, I think I would go with Tom, Siwoo, and Scott for the same amount of money. Okay. But you can play Fair it both enough. ways, really. So, yeah. Let's see, Connors. Although I bet Connors to win. I should probably play that guy, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's how it works. Let's see. Yeah. That that fits. That still leaves $100 on the table. Or you could drop Svensson down to like a Hubbard, and then you could turn Tom Kim into Connors. Then you have, like, what do you think is better, Svensson and Tom Kim or Hubbard and Connors? Hmm. Or Shez and Hideki. I think it's pretty close. I actually Connors and um Hubbard is is pretty attractive there at that number. So let's see, let's see if that actually works. Yeah, it works on the number. Yeah, it should. Yeah. Hundred dollars left. So then yeah. you got Xander, Speeth, Hubbard, Scott, Siwoo, Connors. I like that lineup. 
Yeah, because then you're embracing the I like Svenny a little bit more, but you're just kind of embracing knowing that there's randomness in the 6K range and there's not all that much difference between Svensson and Hubbard in reality. And if you can get up there to Connors, it's nice. All right. Joe, thank you so much for filling in this week, dude. That was fun. Yeah, I appreciate it as always, man. Enjoy the rest of your week. Um, It's always a pleasure to be on the show with you. So thank you for the nod up to the big leagues and uh, happy to do it anytime you need me, brother. Well, I need to let you go because you have a live show in like two minutes, which you probably need to go to. So check out the Preferred Lions podcast from last night, which you'll actually be recording after this show. All right. Uh, you can follow Joe on Twitter at Torpix, me at the PME, playing the Listeners League. That's down in the description. And join Fantasy National, fantasynational.com slash mayo right now. All right. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you next time. Experience. Experience.